In lesson four, we will now discuss the profitability analysis and how our financial ratios can help us with this important analysis of any company we're looking at. The profitability analysis is most useful when the ratios are compared against some sort of standard of comparison. And there's three that I list here. One would be the prior performance of the same company, which basically is a trending analysis of those past results. Second is the current performance of a competitor. For example, may we compare Apple versus Microsoft? And thirdly, we'd have an industry average for a particular ratio. It kind of gives us an idea of how we're doing in relation to our peer group. In this slide, we're going to discuss profitability ratios that measure a company's ability to earn an adequate return. The first one here, as it's noted in red, is a profit margin on sales. It indicates the portion of each $1 of revenue that is available after all expenses have been covered. Basically, it's highlighted in red because we're going to use this ratio later in this module. So the profit margin calculation itself is net income, bottom line on your income statement, divided by the top line net sales. Next, we talk about the all-important return on assets, or ROA, which is a very inclusive way to measure our earnings power of our company that ignores specific sources of financing. Our return on assets calculation is net income, again, bottom line net income, divided by the average total assets based on a two-point average. And lastly, on this slide, we talk about the very important return on equity, or ROE. It's a way to measure the earnings power of our company that is generated from the resources that the shareholders provide. Again, this calculation is, is basically net income divided by average shareholders' equity. In essence, all three of these ratios we've just discussed measure the ability of the company to earn a profit. Now, in this slide, we discuss activity or turnover ratios that measure a company's effectiveness in managing its assets. The first one is the asset turnover ratio. It's basically a very broad measure of asset efficiency as it tells you how many sales dollars each one dollar of assets actually generates. It's highlighted in red as before, as we'll use this ratio again later in the module. This asset turnover ratio is basically net sales, top line sales, divided by average total assets. Next, we talk about the receivables turnover ratio. This provides a monitor of our company receivables and basically their overall collectability. The higher the ratio, the better. This ratio is basically calculated as net sales divided by average net receivables. And lastly, we have the inventory turnover ratio, very similar. This indicates how quickly our inventory is sold. Similar to the receivables turnover ratio we just covered, the higher the ratio, the better. So basically, the higher the ratio this one is, the more profitable our company should be. A declining ratio that may indicate some following issues. It may have a presence of obsolete or slow-moving inventory, and potentially it could be a cause of poor marketing or sales efforts in our organization. The calculation for the inventory turnover ratio is cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. Now in this slide, we're going to talk about the ratios that measure financial leverage. First one we talk about is the equity multiplier. A high multiplier here indicates that the relatively more of the company's assets have been financed with debt. In other words, the higher the ratio, the higher the default risk of our organization. Again, it's highlighted in red as we'll use this ratio later in the module. The calculation for the multiplier is the average total assets divided by the average shareholder's equity. Next, we talk about the debt to equity ratio. This provides a measure of our credit protection in the, in the event of insolvency. As with the equity multiplier, the higher this ratio is, the higher our risk. We compare resources provided by creditors versus shareholders. So for example, if we had a ratio of 0.5, this would indicate that the company is financed by equity twice as much as it's been financed by debt. The calculation for debt to equity ratio is total liabilities divided by total shareholders equity. Now in this slide we can discuss how shareholders may want to understand how the company's return can be improved. Why would they want to do that? Well, it hopefully will lead to higher dividends and more importantly higher share prices. The DuPont framework provides a very convenient basis for this analysis that breaks the return on equity, ROE, into three key components. The first one we take is the profit margin, remember that one, we talked about that with profitability, multiplied times the asset turnover, which measures activity. If you take that sum, that basically is the return on asset calculation, or ROA. Then if you multiply that times the equity multiplier, which measures our leverage we discussed earlier, that gets us to the return on equity or ROE calculation. Okay, that's a lot of terms. Does everyone think they understand this concept of DuPont framework calculation? Why don't you try this concept yourself by analyzing return on equity or ROE for Apple Incorporated for the most recent 10K? 
Now let's move over to the whiteboard to review and discuss this DuPont analysis a bit further. So today we want to talk about the Apple DuPont analysis. As you remember from our lecture, I wanted you folks to kind of do the calculations for the DuPont analysis under the 2016 Apple financial statements. Let's walk through that together today. So if you remember from our conversation, the return on equity is the profit margin times the asset turnover times the equity multiplier. Those can be broken down into the following three formulas. So if you remember from your days of algebra, by crossing through the like signs, basically the first one, the, pro the profit margin times the asset turnover, is our return on assets, which is net income divided by average total assets. For 2016, the Apple ROE is 14.93%, very healthy return. Then the third part of our equation is the equity multiplier, which is average total assets divided by average stockholders' equity. Again, crossing out the like signs, you can basically see that what we're left with on the return on equity is our net income divided by our average stockholders' equity. The equity multiplier for Apple is 2.47. So if I multiply those two out, that comes out to be roughly 37%. Now folks, that's a return on equity of almost 40%. When I see numbers like that, it makes me glad that I'm an investor in the Apple stock. Hopefully, the whiteboard example helped us understand the relationship that DuPont analysis a whole lot better.